All right, welcome back to another episode of Uncaged. Um, I'm your host, Louis Galno. Today I'm joined with Sensei Marshan. He's a head instructor at one of our Pennsylvania schools. Um, so what was Jesus like in person? <laughs> Jesus is a cool dude, man. I wish you could have been around to meet him. Don't let the gray hair fool you. I'm only 100 and I'm gonna be 148 this January, bro. You look good for your age. I look good for 148. You look good for your age. So um, let's jump into it. What are we talking about this week? Uh, well, I think we were going to discuss, um, you know, the, the youth that we have coming in and training in our program and um, the, the difference between, you know, 20 years ago and today with students coming in with ADD and ADHD and how it's progressed um, and that kind of stuff. And I know I remember when I was young, there was no such thing. There was no ADD. There was no ADHD. I was just a bad kid. <laughs> you, were, just, you were a six, was, seven year old boy. I was a problem child. Right. You know, so they didn't put in an alphabet attached to it. Um, but you know, the first time I probably heard, you know, of ADD, that's what it was first, was, you know, 20 years ago when I took my school over and I started teaching. Um, and that's when I started to meet kids that would come in with attention deficit disorder. Um, you know, to me, they kind of just seemed like normal five and six year old kids. I didn't see much of a difference between most of them. Um, but it seems super prevalent today. It seems like it's something that has doubled and tripled over on itself where it used to be one in a hundred kids came in with that diagnosis and now it's one in ten kids is coming in with that diagnosis mm -hmm. um, as well as being on the spectrum the spectrum has grown over the years and it used to be you know two different things with autism and Asperger's and now that's all kind of into one thing and that's something that we're seeing a lot of as well kids coming in and um, you know everybody knows at this point that the martial arts is great for helping kids with self-discipline and self-control and teaching them how to focus, right? right? Everybody knows it's not a secret anymore and everybody knows that Tiger Shulman's is the best with kids. So um, I think that it's more parents are seeking out our program today as alternative methods. Mm -hmm. That's something that I've seen as a, um, a big difference. 10 years ago, it seemed like everybody really wanted to do the medication. That was the thing, we wanted to put them on medication. And what I think we see now is the, the you've seen kids that have been on these medications now for 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. And you see the product of that. So more and more parents are trying to find more holistic ways mm -hmm. to combat these issues. Alternatives besides medication. Alternatives besides medication. So. Um, you know, I think that our program is the absolute best spot, but as we're going to hear a little bit later when we introduce our, um, our guest today, it's not just one thing. You don't just stick your kids into Tiger Showman's, poof, mm -hmm. and it goes away. That's not how it works. We're not magicians, you know, so um, I think that's going to be the topic of what we're talking about today. I would, I would say it's more than one in ten. I mean, I feel like New students coming in, you talk to the parents, I would say one in four, one in three say, oh, you know, the teacher says, you know, he has trouble focusing, they want to get tested for ADHD, ADD. I would say it's one in four, you know, and I'll do, I'll do a 30 minute class with them and I'll let them know, listen, I didn't go to school for it, I'm not a doctor. Nothing wrong with your kid. Yeah. You have a five, six, seven year old boy, he's got a lot of energy. He was able to focus for the last half hour. Why? Because he was engaged, he liked what he was doing. As an adult, if you're reading a book or you're watching a movie and you don't like it, what do you do? You don't take a pill so you can finish. You change the channel, you get a new book, right? right? You're bored. So a lot of times the kids are bored in school. And nothing against teachers, you know, there's some great ones, there's some bad ones. And a lot of times they just want the quick fix. You know, you have to find a way to reach the kid, engage the kid. Maybe they pay attention in science because that interests them, but during math, you know, they doze off. Or maybe they like math and history is where they doze off, yeah. you know? So you have to find a way to reach a kid and get them engaged. And that's why through martial arts, they're learning how to focus, they're learning self-discipline, they're having fun at the same time. So they learn in our class, well, you know, I couldn't do my round kick, but I was focusing and I was paying attention. I got to turn my foot when I kick, so my hip turns, I get power, and I worked on it, I got my new belt, I feel great. Well, maybe if I do that in math, I'll do better in math. Maybe if I do that, you know, in soccer, I, I focus better, I'll do better. And they take what they learned in Tiger Shulman's and they use it in every aspect of their life. I yeah. mean, that was, my parents spent three hundred thousand dollars on education between kindergarten, Catholic school, all the way up into Seton Hall University. Every teacher wanted me to have non-quitting spirit, self-discipline. They didn't show it to me. They just expected me to have it. Right. 
but I learned it through Tiger Solmans. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, you know, the physical nature of our environment <clears throat> is the most important thing, right? Because that's what's, if you look at the biggest change in society over the last 20 years, it's the physical nature of our day. You look at the, last, the change in the last 200 years. Our bodies biologically haven't changed in the last 2,000 years that much. Mm -hmm. But a 1,000 years ago, we had to wake up and we had to starve ourselves for three days and go hunt down our food. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine going an entire day without food and then being physically active now? Because we've created this new body. We're trying to change our body's chemistry to live in this new society, but it's not what our bodies are made for. So the kids nowadays, they're not outside riding their bicycles. They're not running around in the neighborhood. They're not playing with kids you know, every day. I would come in the door from school. I'd come in the side door. I would throw my stuff down and boom, right out the front door. And I was out playing with the kids. But mm -hmm. it's just a much different world now. So kids are a lot more sedentary, mm -hmm. right? You see what the parents have to go through to give, you know, that physical lifestyle to a child. Like me and my wife, we have, I have one kid and we're like outnumbered trying to get him to <laughs> all of these different things. You're at a baseball and we got football and in a hitting clinic and back to MMA just to give him 60 minutes of play a day, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's difficult to do. So that to me is the biggest difference between the kids that are growing up now is they don't have that physical outlet. And that's why we're so successful. You see it all the time. You get a kid, five, six-year-old kid comes in, you start talking to him and he's bouncing <laughs> off the walls. You stop talking, you pull out a pair of mitts, hey, do this, all right? And he starts punching, he starts kicking. All of a sudden. And all of a sudden he just starts turning into this other kid. Right, and then at the end of the lesson, you're like, "Congratulations, you guys! You know, my diagnosis is you guys have a perfectly normal five and six year old boy." And I, I think that that's the biggest difference with today's kids than 20 years ago. The diet is awful, mm -hmm. and the lack of exercise is mm -hmm. really what's behind all of this. I'm, you know, a thousand percent convinced of that. And uh, you know, it's funny. I was watching. Um, I love Caesar Milan, the, the dog whisperer. Yeah, you're telling me about I, 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 I love his show and I'm watching him work with these dogs and I'm like, he needs to do a show on humans, <laughs> right? Like he needs to take the humans and run them up that thing and run around and tie them to a bike and run them around because they would be much different people. What's the best day of the week? Tuesday. I have more energy on Tuesday. Mm. I am more focused on Tuesday. My biggest classes at the school are on Tuesday because my whole staff comes up. We train like crazy. We go back to the school. We drive two hours here, two hours back. But the energy level in my school on Tuesdays is always the best. Why? Because we're training. We're physically active. And that's uh, it's a huge difference. And that's really, that's the story that we're going to tell today is it seems that it's the answer to every question, right? Diet and exercise. What questions can we not answer? But that's not a quick fix. It, it's, it's not, not a not. quick fix and it's not an easy fix. No. You know, I was, uh, I, had a, uh, I was talking with one of the moms the other day who her kid has, you know, he's having some issues and I was talking to her about his diet and it's really, really hard for her with everything that she has in her day and her life. It's super difficult, you know, to provide that really clean, healthy diet for the kids. It's very difficult to it's, do. It's easier, cheaper, faster to get processed fast food than it is to find, you know, good food. Way um, cheaper. Way cheaper. Going back to what you were saying, you know, when parents come in, I say, you know, you spend the first three, four years of a kid's life teaching them to walk and talk and then it's sit down and shut up for eight hours. Right, right. And that goes back to, you know, lack of just moving around, you know. Like, a five-year-old kid's not supposed to sit like this for eight hours, you know? They have that energy. They need, they need to get that energy out. Yeah. So then they can sit and they can focus for a half hour, 45-minute, um, you know, intervals or, or whatever it may be. And I don't know about you, man, but I, I, I really feel bad for the teachers because they're, they're just handcuffed with what they can and can't do inside their classrooms. A lot of them that I talk to, they know how they could make it more fun, more active, you know, but they get in trouble for that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And and that's a, a huge thing too, you know, it's, 
I've had a couple people tell me like, hey, you should go into, you should be a teacher. I was like, I get fired real quick, man. <laughs> <laughs> all the desks would be thrown out the window. I'd have the kids all on the floor. Well, my, my daughter was in Elmwood Park. I think maybe it was first or second grade. We went in for the parent teacher thing. And it was, uh, it was like the first two weeks of school. So the classroom wasn't like a normal classroom. She had six desks where the kids, you know, actually sit in. The desk is kind of like this one, but smaller. She had a circle table. She had a carpet. She had a sofa, like two sofas. And she said, you know, for three or four days, she puts the kids in all the different spots. And she sees where they focus the best. You know, maybe they, they sit good here. Maybe they like slouching on the sofa. Maybe they like sitting on their stomach looking, you know, on the carpet at the chalkboard. She goes, I don't care where they sit as long as they're going to focus the best. Yeah. And I was like, that's pretty cool. You know? That's a charter school? No. It was Elmwood Park uh, Public School at really? the time. Yeah. Oh, props to her. Thinking outside the box, you yeah. know, when you get 20 kids in your class and they're like little fingerprints, man. They're all different. Not all of them are going to learn the same. And, you know, you watch, I, I watch my instructor go down the line and, you know, he literally has a different button to push for every single kid. And, you know, that's the biggest thing when parents come in and like, well, we just wanted him to do it for a month. I was like, a month? My instructor's not going to know what buttons to push after a month. They have to establish a relationship. Mm -hmm. After a kid's been in my class for six months, that's when you really see, because the instructor has learned how that particular child learns. Every kid is different. Right. If Johnny's wiggling, you know, I got to say, uh, you know, Johnny, stop wiggling, and then he'll sit strong because he doesn't want to, you know, be disciplined like that. But if Billy's wiggling, he's like, I don't care. I'm getting the attention. So I have to go, wow, look how strong Johnny's sitting. And then right. Billy's like, oh, call on me. Uh -huh. And then he sits strong. Yeah. And it is. Every kid's different. And like you said, there's different buttons you got to push. You know, Sheehan's the same way when he's coaching us. You know, me and Jimmy like to be slapped before we go in the cage. Some people need a hug <laughs> and say it's going to be all right, you know. So you got to learn what works for everybody. Yeah. 100%. Um, so you're a student. Yes. Who are we bringing in today? So his name is Andrew Walters, and uh, we were just discussing. He's got about 20 years in that he's been training with me. He doesn't, he doesn't cont train continually right now because he's down in, in Washington. He went to Virginia Tech for college, and he wound up staying down in that area. So I get him uh, you know, a couple times a year. He comes home to visit mom, who we're going to meet Renee today as well, because um, she's a, the most integral part of this story. I'm not going to sit here and take credit for any of this, that's, she's the 95% of the story, which is why I wanted her here today, um, because it's the most important piece, um, is, you know, we get the kids for, they're with us for four hours a week, right? You're home with that kid for the other 164 hours of the week, and is it's a- Is your math good on that? Do what's that? Check that? 168 hours in a week, right? <laughs> Can we put that up on the screen? Can we get that? Everybody else gets stuff put up on the screen when they're here, Danielle. They're gonna superimpose it. They're gonna oh, superimpose they're, they're yeah, yeah. Superimpose it right in here, mm -hmm. 168 hours. And then if you're week. wrong, it's gonna be in red and be like, he's wrong. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they're 168 hours in a week and we get them for four hours. So it's the parents that really have mm -hmm. the hardest job. So, you know, that's why I wanted uh, Renee to be here with us today. But uh, so Andrew's been training with me for uh, 20 years now. And uh, when he first started, when he was eight years old, it was, um, it was not a, uh, the relationship that you're going to see that he and I have now is not the relationship that we had when he was eight. Uh, so when he was eight, he was diagnosed with ADHD. And I'm, I don't want to tell you too much of it. I want him to tell you the story. And uh, he, was, he was, for lack of a better term, a handful, <laughs> for sure. He, he tested my patience, and my patience lost he quite pushed, often. He pushed your buttons. He pushed my buttons a lot. Like I said, all of the gray hair on this side of my beard belong to Andrew Walters. These are all Christian Jones right here, and these are Andrew Walters. I got a couple of others speckled in there, but they mostly belong to him. But I'm gonna let him tell the story because he tells it better than I do. And he said he started when he was eight? Yep. And 20 years, so he's 28 years old now. Yep, all right. Eight. Um, Let's jump right into it. Let's bring him and his mom in. So we're now joined with uh, Sensei Marshawn student Andrew and his mom Renee. Welcome guys. Thanks. Nice to be here. Thanks for having um, So Renee, I want to start with you. How did sure. you start Andrew in training? How did you find Tiger Solmans? What sure. led you to, you know, wanting to get him into martial sure. arts? So we knew that there was um, an issue with Andrew when he was young because he couldn't focus and he was getting in trouble in school and getting bullied a little bit. And one day, I think it was a Saturday, he was watching cartoons or something on TV and, and the Tiger Solmans commercial came on. So he came and found me in the kitchen. I remember this clear as day. There are certain things in life as a mom that you remember. He came in and said, Mom, 
I think we should try this because they say that karate is good for kids like me, right? So for one thing, it broke my heart mm -hmm. because he was thinking that. I just went, oh. Yeah. And so I thought, okay, well, you know, I've never heard of Tiger Shulman's. Let's, let's look it up. And so that's kind of what started us on this journey and eventually to find Sensei Marchand. So that's what started it. Sensei Marchand, who, by the way, wanted Rene here so badly that he is sitting <clears throat> on a sharp piece of wood now <laughs> so we could have the couch right. I just wanted to let everybody see the sacrifice. This is the level I'm at. This is not what I got you. to. It's not about you. This it's is the level I'm at in the Sensei organization Marchand, now. He about forgot them. to tell me we were on camera and Renee came in a sweatshirt <laughs> with no makeup today, but I love him anyway. Tiger Solman's sweatshirt. That's right. It's good. So what was, yeah. what was your first impression? So I remember very clearly going into the, uh, gosh, I, I don't remember how many schools ago it was. It was Montgomery Montgomeryville. Ville. So we went into this building that was falling down, basically, because oh, he was in the process. Oh, you were at the original school. Yes, he was in the process of moving mm. to a new school. So the old school was, it was a mess. So he, my younger son, David, was three. He said, you, David, you go out there. Somebody will take care of you. And I was like, what are you doing with my child, right? That, so there's one flag. He brings my husband and I in, and we sit on the couch, and he says, you two don't say a word. So now here's flag two, right? You don't tell me not to talk to my son. I'm, Who is this guy, right? He says, you don't say a word. He brings Andrew in, and they sit facing I think I was a little nicer than that. You, maybe. I might not have been. It was a long time ago. <laughs> they sit cross leg on the floor facing each other, and I'm sitting like this. And I'm going to start to cry because I still choke up when I think of this, but... Within 10 minutes, Andrew looked at him with this rapt expression on his face. And I think he said something to Andrew like, tell me about yourself. Tell me why you think you're here. And Andrew just blurted out all these things. I get in trouble a lot, right? And again, my heart's breaking as a mom. Mm -hmm. I get in trouble a lot. I'm getting bullied. Um, you know, I'm not good. And, and I always said, there's no child that's not good. They may be more difficult, but there's never, there are no bad children, right? So they had this conversation, <laughs> and <laughs> even you, I bet. So they had this conversation, and um, I think I signed up on the spot. And I remember my husband saying, you know, Tiger Shulman's is probably the most expensive. Don't you want to look at any others? I said, absolutely not. This is it. The, like, it was mother's intuition. This is it. We're, this is where we're going to start. And so I, I remember that day clear as a bell. And to set the stage a little bit, when she came into that school, they had literally took a machine. They were knocking the building down and right. moving us to the other side of the, the shopping center. They took a machine and they cut the I-beams and ripped the other stores down because they were unoccupied. I had a freestanding building with I-beams sticking out of the <laughs> sides. It was a mess. That's what they came into. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was, uh, I must have been really good that day to, to sell you on that one. I keep telling everybody, you had a lot more hair that day. Yes. Um, <laughs> Um, so how was his training? So he, he's, you know, the first couple months and stuff like that. The first couple months were, were rough. Uh, I think I still have a picture on my refrigerator of Andrew as a white belt and Christian Jones as a blue belt holding x-ray paper. Uh, the two of them go way back, but, um, it was, it was, Hindsight was probably a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was interesting because he really liked it. He, he was never, um, he was never good at team sports. He was too distracted. You know, soccer was picking daisies in the field, and softball was, you know, let me watch the butterflies. Mm -hmm. um, but, but he he found his niche, I think, in training, and I think it was because it was one on one. There was somebody holding X-ray paper. There was somebody talking to him. You know, and even then, there would be days when it was hard for him to stand still on his spot, right? Um, it was, yeah. Yeah. He was the first person that I met that I was like, all right, he literally can't help you know, getting off a spot or looking around or, right. you know, what he was doing. And, you know, and there was a lot going on. There was a lot going on. He was, uh, he was also very twitchy. He had Tourette's. And he was diagnosed with Tourette's syndrome. Mild, but Tourette's. At what age? Fourth grade. I think it was fourth or fifth grade. It was after he started training. Yeah. yeah. It was after he started training. Yeah. But so he before he started training, was he diagnosed with ADD, ADHD? Y yes, ADHD. And then the Tourette's came later because he had these twitches. And uh, we just didn't know what it was. And so they said he had a mild case of Tourette's, which, which made it even more difficult for him to stand still. Right. Um, when, when you found, how did you find out he was diagnosed with Tourette's? Well, he had already been training at that point. So Renee and I spoke about a him a lot. We had a lot of conversations. And she was like, you know, I, I think I'm going to have him see a neurologist. And I was like, I, 
think that's a real solid idea because there's something more going on, right? It was more than him just not being able to sit still. He was ticky. He was twitchy. So, you know, I didn't have a lot of experience back then. I was still really young, but um, I just said, I think that's a great idea and because I think there's something else going on. And sure enough. Yeah. And it ended up sort of feeding on itself, right? It, <clears throat> the anxiety of his twitching made him nervous, which then made it harder for him to focus, which then made him twitch more. So it was just it was this cycle. cycle that it was re that was really hard to break. Um, you know, and I know earlier you were talking about nutrition. And so we we sort of hit on you know, what I used to say to him all the time, which was um, exercise, nutrition, and sleep. Had to get enough sleep, had to get the right kind of nutrition, um, good proteins, good carbs kind of thing, right? I mean, I'm Italian. It was, you know, here's a turkey meatball and some good pasta, right? I mean, but that was good with a vegetable, not highly processed stuff. Not right. We didn't need a lot of McDonald's and that kind of stuff. So um, that was always really important. And then the exercise, he would train I think he was training three or four times a week. We yeah. were getting there, getting him there, there as much as we can. And we were, I was laughing with him on the way up here that he would come home from school sometimes so twitchy. I would literally tell, tell him, go outside and run around the house four times. <laughs> and I'm going to stand at the kitchen and I'm going to count. And count how many times. Count how many times. And, you know, I'm tired. Can I? No. Nope. Got to keep going. Two more. You can do it. Two more times. And then he'd come in and he, would, he, would, he could sort of take a breath and calm down because he had so much energy. Mm -hmm. it, he just had to get it out, you know, and there weren't any, we lived on a house without, there wasn't a community. You know, there wasn't like I, I could send him outside to play. There were right. no other kids around, so. I don't know if you know, but um, I don't know if Sensei Marjan told you, but I have a special needs child. Uh, my eight year old's on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And there's times where my wife's like, we're going outside and he just cranky, yeah. doesn't want to go outside, especially but in the summer. To. He hates hot weather. But once she gets over that fight and she gets him outside, he'll be engaged in. Yeah playing in the garden or running around for 45 minutes or an hour. But to get him outside, you got to get over that initial battle. Yeah. And then it's like, is this the same kid? He was complaining five minutes ago. Now he's in his own world, playing and jumping around. And then when he comes in the house, he's better, yeah. more well-behaved, more, you know. More attuned. In, yeah, yeah. I used to tell my kids all the time, and I still say it today, it, 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 it's an ABC. It's attitude, behavior, consequence, right? The attitude that you bring into something will directly drive your behavior and there will be a consequence of that behavior. Sometimes it'll be a good one, sometimes it'll be a negative one. But if you start with the right attitude, you're probably going to have the, the right behavior. And so, you know, if he was really cranky, I'd be like, you need to get outside and run and then we'll talk. And then when he came in, he was better. <laughs> and he was better. And we learned real quick that push-ups were a great energy outlet. <laughs> To he's this still, day, he's a push-up machine. Does he have the record in he's, your school? He's a push-up machine. He had the record at his elementary school for a long time. I don't know, I don't know if I have time. it anymore. You ha he had it. He had it I for, had it for a long time. He it had was it like at our grade 130. school. 130. Without stopping. Yeah. Because yeah. that was, on a bad day, he did at 130 push-ups <laughs> in my class. We he learned very quickly. Yeah. So what was, what was, I mean, 20 years ago, it's hard to remember when you're that young, but what was your initial impression of Sensei Mershon or like your first couple months of training? If you can remember it. <clears throat> There's a lot of things that stick in my memory. Um, for Sensei Marchand, uh, it was partially, I was a little afraid, a little, little intimidated, you know. You should have been a lot afraid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then there was uh, the part of me that drove me to the school, the part of me that saw that commercial, that, that looked at that with such, you know, desperation in the mind of an eight-year-old that then saw Sensei Marchand and I thought overwhelmingly this is what I want right I saw him walking around talking to people you know and I thought that's the level of control that's the level of normalcy that I want that's to be eight years old and have that that desperation running through your mind it's it's hard to describe how that felt but that's that's what it was like for me growing up. And the first couple of months training, do you have anything that sticks out in your mind? I remember uh, finding it hard to stand still. Um, back in the, the early, early days, I hadn't learned an, a very important lesson that I, I carry with me now, uh, which is that the Tourette's and the ADHD, those, the neurologic disorders, are a part of me, but they don't define me. I hadn't learned that yet when I was just getting started. So. Uh, I was having a lot of trouble standing at attention. I was having a lot of trouble f focusing on, on exercises. It was fun and it was engaging and that, those, 
very much so helped me pay attention and, and stay engaged. But the moments where I was standing still, there were still, you know, times where I was very energetic and just rambunctious, right? That's where a lot of sensei's gray hairs come from. It's, it happened, right? And it's, and there were also, you know, other, other young children around who were, a lot of whom were also very energetic and we just kind of like pinballs, like bounced off each other. So that didn't help. Um, but uh, as I got more into it, um, I started to slowly calm down some. Well, there's, uh, we were talking last week about the podcast and I didn't want him to tell me too much because I wanted to hear it from you guys and, you know, hear it the first time. But you told me a story that it gave me goosebumps when you told me because, like, the way you said it was how you probably told it to him with such passion and something that he probably needed to hear. Can you tell me that story? Uh, about the... The Run DMC story. <clears throat> oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, what? <laughs> so the, the, one of the biggest things with being diagnosed with something is a lot of people tend to use that as a crutch, right? And that's kind of what we saw right away when, when he was diagnosed with the Tourette's. We told him about it. We let him know what it was and he knew what it was. And literally the next day he comes in and by this point he's a higher rank, right? So he's yellow or green belt. So he's closer to the front of the class. You know, there's a couple lines behind him and uh, you know, class comes out on the mat and we're all standing at attention getting ready to start. And he's you know, he's like run the MC on a spot, just break dancing. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was like, whoa, it was the worst I'd ever seen him. And I looked at him and I was like, Andrew, stand at attention. And he goes, Sansei, I can't, I have Tourette's. And I was like, nope. I said, come up here. And I called him up front of the class and I may or may not have grabbed him like this. Probably. <laughs> probably. It might, it might I, I probably grabbed him pretty good and got real close. And I just told him, I said, do not ever, ever use that as an excuse in my class again. And go back to your spot and stand at attention. And he went back to his spot and he had the fear of God in his eyes and he did the best that he could to stand at attention. But I felt like I was like, I have to draw a line in the sand. That was this kid has moment. to understand right now. I get it. I understand. I'm going to keep that in the back of my head. But you can never ever use that as an excuse because we all have an excuse, right? Every one of us has a weakness. Every single human has something they can say, I can't because I got this. Mm -hmm. And if that's the way that we're gonna teach our students, we're gonna raise a really weak generation. So if there was one thing that I wanted him to get was, I understand, but do not ever use that as a crutch. It is not an excuse. Like he said, and I think that was how he came to the determination this is something that I deal with, but it doesn't define me. It's not who I am. And I think that if you let him use it as a crutch, it becomes who he is, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, that was, uh, and, and I didn't know if that was the right thing to do. I mean, I was just taking a shot in the dark, but in my head, that's what I thought. I cannot let this kid keep continuing to think that he can just do whatever he wants and then just Blame mm -hmm. it on that. That's not going to help him in any way, right. shape, or form. So as an instructor, you got to understand that he has it and you have to be compassionate to that, but you don't let him use it as a crutch. And as we can clearly see, he's in complete control. The mind's a very powerful, powerful thing. When it's fed right and it sleeps, right? And, and me and Renee were such a great team because she made sure that she was, you know, she would go to his school and talk to the teachers. And you yeah. were telling us about the jobs that the teachers would give him. Yeah. When, when he would, uh, there were several things that the teachers did that were just amazing. Um, <clears throat> when they noticed that he was sort of twitchy, they, there was one teacher that would give him, um, what is it, the tacky glue? It's like uh, yeah. silly putty. And he would just sit there and pull the silly putty, right? Because it kept his hands busy. It was um, an outlet. Yeah, it was yeah. just an outlet, but it was enough of a thing that he could do. It's like a worry stone. Some people put worry stones in their pockets. Yeah. Um, so they would do that. Those or, little balls that people's yeah, yeah, it, yeah, just something to keep in his hand. And, or if they noticed he, it was, he really needed to get up, they would make up an excuse to send him down to the principal. They'd give him a stack of papers, and he, did, he didn't know this, but the papers were blank. I learned that 
today, like yeah. before this. <laughs> they, were, they were literally blank. Maybe been, there was a I've cover sheet. I've been bamboozled. Sheet. Yeah, I was I've been yeah. duped. They would just say, Andrew, the I get a, I get a job. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. I got a job. Your whole life has been a force. And, I, and I, <laughs> I will say, he's a very good student. He's very smart. He's a smart kid. He's an engineer. But... Um, so it, it's not like he was going to miss something by being out of the classroom for 15 minutes, right? Mm -hmm. So they would send him down. Sometimes the principal would say, oh, Andrew, I really need these papers collated. Can you take one of these, one of these, one of these? And maybe it was something real. I mean, I literally one time they had him separate paper clips. They would just sit him in the <laughs> office and let him do something different to give him a break yeah. and let him calm down. And then they, you know, sometimes they'd let him do his homework in there. They just, the school knew him well enough that they knew what he needed. What he needed. They were accommodating. They I were very accommodating. Push -ups. Yeah, <laughs> push, -up, push ups worked in the either inside. He's, he's gonna, either he's going to stop moving around or he's, <laughs> he's going to be get really strong. strong. That's There's right. going to be a positive That's benefit right. no matter what. Well, really eventually, strong. I'm going to stop moving around either way. <laughs> he's yeah. really strong. Yeah. Um, so, when was he diagnosed with Tourette's? How old? Uh, I think he was in fifth grade. Uh, yeah, it was. T 10, 11? I had been dealing with Tourette's Since well before the diagnosis. I remember distinctly being at home having these so you know if I can I'll, I'll take you guys on a on a bit of a journey and explain like just kind of in my mind how this felt and how it sometimes still feels having Tourette's is like having an itch on parts of your body right you want to scratch an itch right your arm itches you're gonna scratch your arm your leg itches you're gonna scratch your leg right now imagine that the parts of you that, that itch the way that you itch them is by performing a movement or by making a sound. My hand itches and the only way that I can scratch it is by like making a fist, right? And I, I do this all, and I were to do this all day, we would call that a tick. If I couldn't, if it was hard to stop. Um, I, I've had so many, they're called, they're split into two groups. They're called motor and vocal, right? Physical and, and sound ticks. Over the years, when I was younger, I had I had many. The you know I would move my head around. I would like tap my feet. I would always be uh, drumming on something. But that's like you just were. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's the way that it that it feels. It's it's like having an itch in parts of your body, and and instead of scratching it the way that you normally would, you you perform a motion, an action, make a sound, something, and that is how you make that itch go away for a little bit, mm -hmm. and then it eventually comes back, right? All the time, that is how I felt. And even and even before your diagnosis, you felt like that, and then it kind of made sense when you got the diagnosis. Yeah. When I got the diagnosis, I, I was still a little young to understand exactly what it meant. I remember, I have hazy memories of being brought into more than one neurologist's office where these people in, in you know, white coats were speaking to me and saying, like, this is what you have. Uh, I remember being a little upset, right? Because sure. having it be labeled and official like that made me feel like it was something that was harder to combat. It lent it an air of, of importance that I didn't like. Right. I wanted it to just be something that was, you know, temporary. Like, oh, don't worry about it. It'll, it'll go away. When they would, it's a broken finger, it'll heal. Right, when they would say to me, you have this, and I, I remember asking uh, the neurologists, uh, is there, what can I do? Is there something that I can do? You know, will this go away? You know, couched in the language of a, a eight or nine year old, right? But I, I wanted to know, what do I do about this? Yeah, how do you fix it? Am I gonna live with this forever? And without, exception, without fault, every single neurologist that I remember talking to told me, you will have this for the rest of your life, you can maybe deal with it with, a, deal with, it with some medication, but there's not really anything you can do, there's no cure, there's no fix. And I remember being really upset when I heard that. That's, <coughs> it had a big impact on me to hear that. And how did you feel when you heard that? I was crushed. Because, you know, you, you see characterizations of people with Tourette's on TV shows, and it, they're really bad. I mean, they're, Andrew had a milder case of it, um, and I remember those questions. And one of the things they said was sometimes, especially with boys, when they go through puberty, the Tourette's can sometimes subside. 
No, either oh. escalates or it can subside because it's some of the hormones, I guess. It, it just kind of makes it better. I don't know. So he was on medication for quite some time to help him. But again, it, everything was so kind of comorbid. It was, it was the ADD. It was his anxiety about the ADD. It was him being bullied because of the Tourette's. It was all kind of jumbled. It, it was like having a tangled ball of, yarn, yarn, uh, ball of yarn, you know, until you really pulled it apart and dealt with each thing. It was hard to know how to deal with it. So we were really worried about it. And were the medications helping when you it, started taking the Tourette's? Did they uh, the Tourette's interfere medication, with each other? The Tourette's medication helped a little bit, but when he was on the ADD medication along with it, yeah, that was that was a hard time. They were, time. Fighting, each other. They were yeah. fighting each other, and that so was a hard time for me. When he first came in, when he was eight, when he first started training, he was on medication for the ADHD at that time. He was, and then the Tourette's got added. And, and then they put that medication together, yeah. and and that's, that was tough. That was the best way that I could describe it, and it was painful to, to watch because you you could tell that there was two things There's inside, and they were you know constantly adjusting it and I trying was, to make it work together. Yeah, yeah. I was pretty miserable. The I went through a couple medications. I was on Adderall. I was on Stratera. I was on Those Risperdal. Two. Was the right. uh, Tourette's medication. Right. Adderall and Risperdal, especially those. Those two. It was bad. It was. It was awful. What would they? What would they do? Would they make you feel? So, he was miserable. He was cranky. He yeah. Was the, just not himself. The Tourette's medication kind of worked by putting like a dampen on that itch. It made right. it like it, less powerful. But the Adderall was weird. Right, Adderall is it's something like two steps away from meth. Right, it's it's a it's a weird drug to to give. But when I was on that, it was really good at a making me not hungry for like twelve hours. Like, man, I would forget to eat when I was on that. But it also uh, helped with the ADHD. But it made me while it helped me focus that that huge amount of energy that I had. It also really conflicted harshly with the Risperdal. I mean, I, I couldn't explain exactly why, but I remember having the two of those together was, was an unpleasant experience. And did you feel the same way? Like, he wasn't as they're the putting same him kid. on medication, were you kind of like, I want to find something, yeah. an yeah. alternative? Yeah, for sure. And so that's, that's the, the more that I saw the, how well his behavior responded to the things that Sensei was doing, the things that were happening in school, did a lot of praying. Right? There was a lot of stuff that we were just sort of holistically trying to think about. How do I how do I draw out Andrew? Right? Mm -hmm. How do I get back to my little boy? Um, and I think it was. But at the end of the day, it was him. It was him. He had to decide. I mean, it was him that decided I want to do karate. Right. It was him that decided I don't want to be on this medication anymore. It was him that decided, you know, I, I know that I'm a smart kid. I'm, I'm, I want good grades. And right? how old are you when you decided you want to be on medication anymore? 13. Well, I decided I didn't want to be on yeah. it. 12 or 13, right? 13, red belt. That was when I said yes. I don't think that was when I decided 11. You probably decided 11. earlier than that. So yeah. even younger. So at that point when he wants, he wants to get off the medication, are you going down the rabbit hole of alternatives, nutrition? I didn't mention this to you. I don't think he told me then. I didn't. So I'm gonna get emotional when I talk about this. It's okay, we all cry on Uncaged. We all, we all cry. <laughs> Just you wait, I'll make you cry. <laughs> That's not hard to do. That's not hard to do. It won't be the first time. So, you know, I came into martial arts, right? I was training and I was, I was really excited. I was also really challenged. It was hard. It was hard for a lot of reasons. It was hard physically, right? It was a tough workout. It was hard mentally, right? Every day was, was a challenge. I was also being bullied at school for being so uh, hyperactive and, and finding it hard to control myself. I was also, you know, I would get picked on for having Tourette's, right, the twitchy kid. I'm also vertically challenged, so it was very easy to, you know, <laughs> pick on you me. You took care of that though, right? Yeah, I took care, care of that. We actually yeah. did. We'll, we'll get to that, we'll yeah, get to yeah, that. We'll we get to that. Flown. Um, so, it was rough. I, I would come home from school and cry. I would uh, go into school and cry sometimes, but I was, I was unhappy. I decided after <coughs> two or three years of martial arts, I was 10, 11, I had been training with Sensei Marchand that whole time. I'd been surrounded by 
people who wanted the best for me and believed in me, right? Um, after hearing from Sensei Marshan that, that turning point of don't use this as an excuse, that started to shift my attitude towards my neurologic disorders. I started to, instead of thinking of them as uh, what defined me, I, I started to view them more as not only a part of me, but also as something to be overcome. I, even when I was eight, I desperately wanted to be normal. And whether that was going to be medication or, or exercise, whatever, I, I just wanted to be normal. When I got to be 10 and 11 and I was, I was dealing with this awful clash of medication, I had points where I was like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be taking this medication anymore. This feels like it's just making it worse. And I knew something about myself by that age. What belt was I? I was like 11? Green? You'd probably be a yellow. Yellow, yellow or green when you were 11. Yeah. <clears throat> I had realized by then that the ADHD and the Tourette's both uh, receded in the same circumstances. The itching from the Tourette's was, was this restless, almost nervous energy. And the ADHD was just energy. I mean, it was, if I was engaged on something and I could pay attention, I had no trouble paying attention to something for, for 10 straight hours. I mean, I could, I could play the same game or read a book. And when I was reading a book, I was like death. I was still for, for hours and hours on end. If I didn't want to pay attention to something, that is when it became difficult and I got rambunctious and moved around. But I discovered that when I was so completely physically exhausted that I could barely move, that that itching, restless energy of the Tourette's and that huge just reserve of crazy hyperactive energy from the ADHD, those were gone because I would dump that energy into the training that I was doing. Push-ups. Yeah. <laughs> I That's, would. He was training probably two classes a day, three, three to four times a week. I, was I, I pretty much lived at the school at that point. Eight to ten hours a, a week I was in the school training. Yeah. And what would happen is I would dump that energy into training. And when That's it was true. gone, I felt normal. I felt like I could be myself as a 11-year-old kid. And at that point, that is when I realized that there was a way out. There was a way that I could overcome those mental disorders that I had. And that's what I started to work for. So I was still taking the medication up until I was uh, 13. 13. Um, but in the back of my mind, that's what I thought about. I don't remember if I talked to you about it before my test. I didn't tell her. You, did, you um, wanted to walk in, you graduated eighth grade, you were turning 13 in July and, and got your black belt in June. So graduated in June, got your black belt in June, turned 13 in July, and you, walk, you wanted to walk in his office and tell him that it was the last day you had to take a medication. You, I don't remember what day that was and where in there, but you I wanted, that. I remember that. I'll tell you, you what I... Because <laughs> you didn't want me to tell him. You wanted to be the one to walk in man to man and say to him, I am Did no I longer that? on medication. Yeah. That's how I found out. Yeah. Well, as I, remember, I remember it was after school. It was in the summertime because <laughs> you didn't want to stop it during the school year. And right. waited until the right. summertime. And, and he got his and, belt. And, yep. Yep. What I remember is at my black belt test, I went, the hardest part of that test, um, I don't know if it's, it's probably way different now, but the... <laughs> When I did it, we had the, uh, the strength training part of it, you know, push-ups, sit-ups. Um, we had uh, splits. Uh, thankfully, I think I got to avoid that because I was 13, right, <laughs> right, right above the cutoff, um, which is good because my splits were not. I was not at the ground. You can um, do push-ups, though. <laughs> you can do push-ups, though. He keeps going back to the push-ups. Yeah. Um, I do self-defense. Yep, you know, close-range self-defense, all of those forms, like two-man choke from the right. front. Um, and then we did uh, all your techniques in a row. And then we did sparring. We had five two-minute rounds of kickboxing, I think two four-minute rounds of grappling. Still remembers. <laughs> and by the end of that, 
actually I think it was two six minute rounds, yeah. Um, by the end of that, I was, I was dead, or I was dead tired. But I had to stand there at attention, and I had to wait for every other person to be done I remember with this the test. Part. I was at attention for at least a half an hour, and it felt like forever. It felt like it was, a, it was an eternity waiting at attention. That was the hardest part of the test, was standing there. And he can tell you the only part of me that was moving was my right big toe. Like this one. <laughs> I remember you, you, were pushing, you were pushing all the yeah. energy. Yeah. I was yeah. nervous. I was like, oh, this is where he's going to fail. Like, I have him standing at attention. And, I, and he's just like a statue. And I was like, and I looked down at his big toe. Like, <laughs> <laughs> just going like a yeah. bunch of miles. And I was like, look at that guy. He's yeah. challenging all of his big toe. It's amazing. But, uh, after the, the test... Right, I got my belt. Uh, I wouldn't let him tie it. I walked over, had him tie it on me. And what I remember, I don't remember actually going into your office. What I remember is, at the test, he told me words that stuck with me for the rest of my life. And that was, it wasn't the medication doing the work. It was you. And I heard that. And that is when I decided it is, it's time. And I came off all of the medication that I was on shortly after that, and I've never gone back on it since. And was it all sunshine and rainbows once you got off of the medication? Not. Or was it, <laughs> no, of course Or did course it all not. start all over again and it was learning to... It, it, didn't, it didn't quite start all over again. Because I had learned by then. In order, in order to get my belt, I had to learn yeah. that I was the one in control. Right? If I have an itch, I can ignore an itch. If I have energy, I can channel that energy. I am effectively doing for myself what the medication was imperfectly trying to do for me. But that was a lesson that I had to learn in order to get my belt. And I can tell you, through his years of college, there were times when, I mean, he went to Virginia Tech. He was, he's an engineering, he dual degreed in engineering and creative writing. Accidentally. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> About the opposite ends of the spectrum, right? But, but he, his love of reading and his love of computer science, right? Anyway, there were some rough semesters. And I can't tell you how many times I would say to him, what would Sensei Marchand say? What would Sensei say to you right Let's now? Go do push -ups. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know about that then or I would have said it. But he'd be like, don't give up, right? Stay focused. And he would just kind of, you know, all of those lessons. Sometimes he needed that reminder still. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when, every time he co would come home, they would disappear in his office for an hour and they would have a conversation and he would feel better when he came out. So, yeah. no, it's never over. A couple right? phone calls. Couple, yeah. you know, it never texts goes away. It's just, it, it's just sometimes, you know, you just have to be reminded, go back to what works. You know, when you're a college student, you don't always eat well. You don't always get enough sleep, right? I'm sure he got enough sleep every weekend, right. and, you know. If I was in the computer science lab until two in the morning, yeah, I would sleep until noon the next day. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, it's never over. It's, right. it's a constant struggle, but, um, but yeah, he, he, he's learned those lessons, and so. As, as the mom, I just have to remind him every once in a while, you know, yeah. every once in a while. He's, he's pretty good now. You know, the most amazing thing about having <clears throat> Andrew as my student was he's my ammunition, right? So now anybody that I've dealt with since watching him do what he did, because it was the most amazing thing that I've ever seen, was him coming in and deciding, Jet Sensei, I want to let you know, I'm done with this. Like I was, as a former drug addict, right? I was so proud that he was like- At 13. At 13, I'm taking a stand. I don't wanna be on this anymore. It makes me feel like this. And I knew that what he had accomplished wasn't the medication, right? Cause he, you saw him come in on the medication and be all over the place. And then you saw him come in on days and he wasn't. So I knew it wasn't the medication. I knew it was him and it was his decision. But after watching him do that, it empowered me to tell people the truth. You know, so as a former drug addict and alcoholic, what's the number one thing that they tell you is that you're always a drug addict, you're always an alcoholic for the rest of your life. One drink and you go right back. And that's what I would tell myself every morning. You're a drug addict, you're an alcoholic, let's go start the day. And then I realized after watching him do what he did that I was still a slave to drugs and alcohol. I don't wanna be a slave to drugs and alcohol. If he can overcome like a, a real neurological disorder, then certainly I don't have to be a slave to any kind of a substance. 
And it was that day that I stopped being a drug addict and alcoholic. I'm not anymore. I have 1,000% control. I want to have a glass of wine? I have one. If I don't, I don't. Zero control over me. And he taught me that. And I've been able to take that and teach thousands more people, mm -hmm. you know? So that's why I wanted to do this when Danielle was like, hey, do you have a story that you can tell with a student? This was the only thing that kept coming into my head because if he can do that, right, then all of these other families that are dealing with all of these things, they can do it too. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I tell the parents all the time, I say, look, I, I don't agree with the medication. I don't believe in the medication. I spent a long time getting off drugs. I don't agree with drugging anybody for anything. It messes with whatever. That's my opinion. But if you decide to do it, I have you back a thousand percent. Because I only got them for three hours a, a week. But you know, just I know be it's with not you. the only thing, right? The, the medication right. is only one. Even if you decide, because we did decide. We, we thought that was the best thing for him. But that's, it's not a magic pill. No. It's not. It's, but people think it is. And sometimes, right. and sometimes, right. And sometimes it's just for a transition period, right? Like, like with the Tourette's. Eventually, he came out of it. So, you know, people have to make the decision they feel is best for the kid. But I, I want to say something about what you just said about using Andrew. I remember when we, well, sometime within the first year, when he was still having so much trouble. Um, you know, and trouble meets trouble in school, right? You're going to gravitate towards the other kids who were in trouble. And I remember um, looking, on, looking at the mat, and at that point, Sensei Billings had just gotten his black belt as a young teenager. And I think Kellen Lewis was still training at the school. And I remember saying to him, see those two? Those are the kids you need to emulate. That's what you need to be, right? And, and again, I mean, he had Sensei as his instructor, but there were other people not quite so far off in his age group. Old. No, Go I ahead, didn't you say, can say old. <laughs> okay, fine, not so old. Um, there were other kids that he could look to to say, yeah, that, that's who I want to follow, right? And to me, as a, again, as a mom, that's the power of this organization, that there are so many good role models, right, that they can look up to, that it, it sort of made him want to continue to come back because he wanted that too. He wanted to be in that first spot. I mean, when his younger brother, who's four and a half years younger, got his black belt, I was like, you're the same rank. You're both, sem <laughs> it doesn't matter, I go first, right? <laughs> I he didn't wanted, stop him from walking into my foot at home sometimes. Yeah, so it, it, he... Uh, that meant something to him. Being on that spot, like those other black belts, meant something to him. Example. Right. Yeah. So when he, you know, his black belt speech was, was I don't, we were talking about it on the way up, was moving. You, he made you cry. Yep. I don't even remember what I said, to be honest. Yeah. But that's important. I think that's also important, again, when you, when, you know, when parents look at where am I going to have the, the investment of time and money and energy for my kid, something that's so long lasting, the relationship, it's 20 years right? It's 20 years. Yeah. It's a long lasting relationship. And I think that's also really important. Um, not that sports aren't important. You know, you want to play sports, you want to do different things, you have seasons. But for a kid like Andrew, you need that longevity and you need that relationship, that bond, that bond right? Mm -hmm. That bond. Yeah. So I wanted to say that too. But he'll tell you that it can be done, right? That's the most important thing. Whoever you are, Whatever your weakness is that you're dealing with, whatever your diagnosis is, whatever issue you have as a human, Andrew will tell you, you got this, you can do it. Is it easy? No. It wasn't easy on her, it wasn't easy on me, it wasn't easy on him. But it can be done, right? Throw out the processed foods. Yep. Change your diet. No sugars. I mean, clean, healthy eating. Cook your food at home. No soda. No soda. Oh. No any of that junk and exercise, 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 and lots of structure. Mm -hmm. It can be done, you know, and like I said, you know, he overcame two things that are very, very real. And if he can do that, then, you know, it, it inspired me and it can inspire, it should inspire everybody else to know that there are other ways. And I will say if there's, you know, anybody watching this who struggles with mental illness, struggles with neurologic disorder, if you've ever felt to yourself like the burden that you have is heavy, like it's, it's this weight that's bearing you down, you can find your way out of that. It starts with wanting to. When I was eight, I just wanted to be normal. 
I wanted to stop being bullied. You know you're still not normal. <laughs> I'm the, all right, I just want to make sure you... I mean, what's yeah. normal? What's right. normal? I'm not normal. Yeah. yeah. I got a, I'm I got, glad you're not normal. I just wanted to let you know. You keep saying that. I just want to make sure you... That's true, not. yeah. But, yeah, I, I wanted to desperately, more than anything, I wanted to overcome these things that I felt like were not me. They were, they were part of me, they were there, but it, it felt like this, kind of like this adversary. And that's how I set it up in my, in my head, was this is something that is here for me to overcome. That's all I wanted. That's really what I wanted when I was a kid, as I got older, right? That is what pushed me. And I discovered more things along the way. I discovered a, an intense love of martial arts. I discovered the, the family that we have that's really like nothing else I've ever experienced. Um, there was a lot. I discovered push-ups. <laughs> I discovered those pretty often. Really Maybe like push-ups. four times a week I discovered push-ups. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I think we're going to end on that. Uh, right. Thank you for coming in, guys. Thank yeah. you for sharing your story. It was, uh, you know, again, as a special needs parent, it takes the work. It's not mm-hmm. easy. Um, there's ups, there's downs. And, um, you know, you're just an example of that you can overcome anything. You know, the mind is a powerful thing and uh, more power to you. And thank you for sharing your story. Thanks Thanks for for having us. I'll see you guys next time. Oops.